Chapter 2, The Constellations The twelve great constellations of the zodiacal belt, which forms the Earth's orbit and the Sun's shining pathway around the celestial universe, have been considered as mere imaginary figures or emblems invented by an early primitive people to distinguish the monthly progress of the Sun, to mark out in a convenient manner the twelve great divisions or spaces of the solar year. To this end, it is thought the various star groups termed constellations were fancifully imagined to represent the various physical aspects of the month under or into which they were consecrated by the sun's passage during the annual journey so that in some sense the 12 signs of constellations were symbolical not only of the seasons but also the labors of the year. That such a system seemed perfectly natural to the learned mythologist and that granting the ancients so much is a very great concession toward this childish knowledge is of course quite excusable when we're constantly told or reminded that actual science, that is to say exact science, does not date backward more than a couple of centuries at most. Even the modern astrologer, much as B decants upon the influence of the 12 signs, has but little, if any, real knowledge of this matter above and beyond the purely physical symbolism above mentioned. And perhaps it is as well that such a benighted condition prevails, and that the divine heavenly goddess is unsought and comparatively unknown. The celestial Urania, at least in such isolation, remains pure and undefiled. She is free from the desecrating influence of polluted minds. Such, in brief outline, is the general conception of mankind regarding the shining constellations that bedeck like fiery jewels their maker's crown, illumine with their celestial splendor the wondrous canopy of our midnight skies. There's no more than a symbol of rural work in the bright radiance of the starry Andromeda, the harbinger of gentle spring. Nothing, think you, but the fruit harvest and the vintage in is in the fiery, flushing luster of Antares and an ominous scorpion? Are men so spiritually blind that they can perceive nothing but the symbol of maturing vegetation and the long summer's day and the glorious splendor of Castor and his starry mate and brother Pollux? It would indeed seem so, so dead is the heart and callous the spiritual understanding of our own benighted day. To the initiate of Urania's mysteries, however, these dead symbolic pictures become endowed with life. These emblems of rural labor or rustic art transform themselves from the hard, chrysolitic shell and expand into the fully developed spiritual flowers of spiritual entities, revealing in their bright, radiating lines the awful mystery of the soul's genesis, its evolution and eternal progressive destiny amid the mighty, inconceivable creations yet to come, pointing out each step and cycle in the soul's involution from its differentiation as a pure spiritual entity, a ray of divine intelligence to the crystallization of its spiritual forces in the realms of matter and its evolution of progressive life, the same eternal symbols of the springtime, the glorious summer, the autumn, and winter of its eternal being. In making this attempt, probably the very first within the era, to convey in plain and undisguised terms the interior mysteries of the twelve constellations, the reader and student is advised to ponder deeply upon the outlines presented. The subject is too vast to present in one or two chapters. Therefore, we hope that this subject is we hope that this revelation may incite the student to further research. The real significance, the true spiritual importance of such mysteries can only be realized and fully appreciated after prolonged meditation and careful study. With this brief digression, which we consider needed advice, we will resume our task and attempt to usher our student into the weird labyrinth of Solomon's starry temple, the house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. <laughs>